there's a new Vic Dog book coming out from the editor of Sports Illustrated magazine, and it is all about the Vic Dogs that lived, where they ended up, what they're doing, kind of a where are they now book. I haven't seen the book, so I have no idea <coughs> exactly what's in the book, but apparently uh, Seven and Machiavelli, uh, both two of the dogs that ran a film victory to the underdog, um, are in the film. <coughs> so, that's what I'm working on right now. And Brandon is the owner now, the adopter of Machiavelli, one of three dogs, Vic dogs, that were signed over to a partnership of the Georgia SPCA and All or Nothing Rescue, which is run by tattoo artist Brandon Bond. The organization has saved more than 400 dogs. And we thank you so much, Brandon, for uh, joining us for part of our show today. So, uh, did you see the Michael Vick story on television and immediately want to rescue one of these dogs, or how did Machiavelli come to, to you? You know, it's kind of an interesting story, because uh, obviously in Atlanta, the story was larger than anywhere else, because that's where Vick was a quarterback. And uh, as soon as the case broke, it dominated every channel for, for several days. But as soon as I saw it, I, I leaned over and I told my wife, we were watching television, I told her, we're getting, we're getting some of these dogs. We have to get some of these dogs. And, and of course, normally when, when something like this happens, the dogs are euthanized when they're no longer good as evidence. So she didn't believe me. And uh, I said, no, 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 I think, I think that we can get them. And the truth is, I knew somebody would get caught eventually, a, a high profile person, you know, a musician or an athlete, somebody was going to get caught. And, and I saw it as an opportunity to, uh, to act. And, uh, and it worked out great. They didn't, they didn't euthanize them. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me about Matt. Matt is the most amazing dog ever. He still struggles a lot, though. Um, Machiavelli was, and that was the reason that we selected him to, to foster and eventually adopt, because he. He seemed to be the most afraid of all of them. He's never had any animal aggression, no people aggression, but he's just scared. Aww. So it, it took a long time for him to even like trust people to give him food. Um, it's not that, that he was in any way aggressive ever. I've never seen it once in a couple of years now, but he was just deathly afraid. Like if, if you open a soda can here and he would run and hide under his bed. Like oh. he, every little sound was like a, a war zone in his head. It was sad. But now he's, he's much better. And uh, he loves the other dogs. He lives with five other rescued animals. And uh, he's inseparable with his girlfriend named Annie Oakley. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great name. <laughs> Well, you know, it was interesting. We were already filming the rescue of Annie Oakley, his girlfriend, um, before the big case broke. So it actually made our film like a, a much, a much more dynamic experience. We were, we were just working with her, and she was incredibly emaciated, uh, neglected. She wasn't a fighting dog. She was just uh, nobody fed her and dumped her somewhere. And uh, so all that was happening in the background of the film. Like when the news broke, you can actually see it on the news in the background. Oh. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Good timing. Yeah, yeah, remarkable timing. And Jim, these dogs were all tested, if you outline that process pretty thoroughly in the book, to make sure that they could be adopted. They were looked at very, very carefully. Yeah, the ASPCA sort of put together this expert team, and they went in and they had a whole series of tests that they did, uh, you know, to try and just uh, ascertain the dog's disposition. And then they put them into, it's like, four different categories based on what they thought the potential was. Some of them, like Mac, you know, most of them, the most common thing was, was what Brandon saw with Mac, just this sort of skittishness and fear. What does this tell us? What is this story of redemption? And I'd like to hear both of you talk about this. I know you've rescued a number of dogs. Uh, Brandon, so maybe we should start with you. A dog that has, who has been abused, maybe even a dog who's been a fighter, can become a dog who's really a wonderful pet and maybe even a therapy dog. What does it tell us about this breed 
in our perceptions of dogs that we think are bad dogs. Brandon? Well, you know what I've found is that there, there is no, no dog on earth that is uh, more astute, intelligent, loyal, protective than a pit bull. And, and uh, gratitude is, is the number one overwhelming sense that I get from, from rescue animals in the sense that like I, have, I have one dog that's not a rescue, it just happened to end up with us. And it's full rotten, whereas all the rescue dogs, every time you give them a bowl of food, it's almost like Christmas Day to them. Oh. It's, it's a mirror. It's like they won the lottery <laughs> twice a day. Oh. It's spectacular. Wouldn't trade it for anything. Oh. And I don't think that, that dogs, you know, have that sense unless they've gone without. So as sad as it is, it actually ends up uh, making it like they're open in presents constantly. Oh. So it's, it's, it's a good experience. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, that, that you know, I don't obviously don't have the first-hand experience, but but one of the things when you know there was the original original magazine story, but when we when it came time to write the Lost Dogs, one of the great things that I felt about that was it was a chance to really get into all that stuff about pit bulls. You know, the history of the breed, right. where they came from, how they developed, and, and why they've gotten sort of unfairly this bad reputation, and and really sort of trying to expose what these dogs are really about and how that. You know, if, if they're socialized and, and raised properly and treated properly, they could be the sweetest loving dogs as, as anything else out there. And for some reason, you know, that's just a message that hasn't gotten out to, to most of America. But hopefully this will help, you know, start turning the tide. Yeah. Let's take a, uh, one call at least while you're with us, Brandon. Ron in Viroqua. Hi, Ron. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I inherited a Birkinshire Bull Terrier, a.k.a. Pitbull. And uh, my uh, partner at the time had to move into a townhouse and she couldn't have the dog, so uh, she asked if I could take her. Well, I lived with my 91-year-old mother at the time, and my family was strictly against it, but uh, Ninja Rosie was her name. And uh, she uh, had her tail, she was uh, 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 picked up as a puppy, raised with nothing but love. and. Uh, my partner brought her over to the house one day when the family was there and we were sitting in the backyard and uh ninja just went right to my mother put her head on her lap Aww. and it was a match made in heaven Aww. and uh, it's kind of hard but um, <clears throat> uh, from that day on um, she stayed with her i mean she would sit she would lay by her side uh, uh she, my mother started to fail in health. Mm. Uh, Ninja was just at her, with her all the time. Mm. And then uh, Rosie, Ninja Rosie um, came ill, and uh, we had to put her down in January this year. And um, a month later, my, my mother passed away. Mm. But uh, she was by far the most fantastic dog I had ever owned or known in my whole life. Mm. Love, I mean, that's all she knew was love. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make that comment. No, I'm so glad you did, Ron. Th thanks you for know, the call. People, people have such a twisted idea about this role. I mean, all the stories that my family heard were uh, all the bad ones. Right. They, when they met uh, Ninja, they just fell in love with her. Mm. Thank you so much for your call. Uh, Jim, do you want, we do have that image of pit bulls. What a story. It's making yeah, me cry. You know, that's the thing. Which, once you start scratching below, like the surface of pit bulls, the, the, the wall that you meet when you start the topic is all the bad stuff. But once you start poking behind that at all, you hear these kinds of stories over and over again about, you know, people have these experiences, just not of just being great dogs, but even beyond that. Like, you know, there, there's so many people I get these emails and notes from, I will never own another type of dog than a pit bull. And, you know, it, and it, it's out there everywhere. So it, it's sort of amazing that, you know, it, it takes a little bit of looking, but once you look, you'll find, you know, something totally opposite to what the general uh, presumption is. Yeah. Brandon, I'm sure you have some stories. Definitely. Uh, Ron's story actually is, is just like Jim said, amazingly common. Um, you know, pit bulls were originally like the family dog that, uh, in, in this country. Um, like when the man would leave the ranch or whatever, the, the dog would herd and watch the children. It's, it's uh, unfortunately part of the reason that they have been exploited. If you look at, and unfortunately I had to go through thousands of hours of, of stock dog fighting footage uh, uh. to make my film, 
But the, the overwhelming constant that you always see is there's always a handler inside the ring and the dogs are doing their best to impress the handler. They're, they're basically willing to die because they're so loyal to the, the, the monster on the other end of the leash. Um, and that is, is horrifying to me. Um, but I am one of those people. I will never own another dog other than a pit bull.